still with the name Mahmet or the title Mahmet, which as we're now finding is the altogether lovely, uh, the praised one, the lovely one. There's uh, the, it's, it's a title for the Messiah. It's a title for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, or for what the Jews believe is he who's yet to come. But in every case, we have been seeing all these different titles. We just saw in the last episode that also the word Aziz, which is in chapter 9, verse 30, is also referring to the Messiah or the uh, the second coming of Jesus, depending if you're a Jew or a Christian. Now, we're going to go to some more titles. Uh, wait till you find out about these. I'm not going to spill the beams. I'm going to let Mel, my good old buddy over here, who has been working along with A.J. Dius and Odon Lafontaine uh, there in Europe, to come up with even more titles. In fact, a whole chain of Muhammad's I think we're going to look at next. So, over to you, Mel. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I suppose the key thing is, is Muhammad a name or is a title? And I think the evidence you're going to see today will confirm that actually you're dealing with not just one individual, but a series of people who can put on the hat, as it were, of a title called Muhammad and play out the role of a Muhammad for their people. So without further ado, I'm going to just share my slides with you. So we're going to look at two pieces of evidence, St. John of Damascus and some Chinese sources. St. John of Damascus is a bit of a hint. You kind of have to read between the lines. Um, he is working in the administration or, or was before he became um, a monk. Um, he was closely associated with the Umaid uh, dynasty. He, he, um, he had a lot to lose if he if he was too um, overt with what he was telling us. So he had to kind of couch things in a way that you could read between the lines, as it were. But the Chinese sources, I believe, will make it even more explicit. So here we go. St. John of Damascus is, is found in the Fount of Knowledge. We've read this probably a hundred times over and maybe not noticed this. He says, and so down to the time of Heraclius, they were very great idolaters. He's referring to the Arabs. From that time to the present, a false prophet named Muhammad has appeared in their midst. Now, let's analyze that for a second. He's talking about from that time. From that time is referring to Heraclius. So Heraclius ruled from 610 to 641. But when was St. John of Damascus writing? Well, he was writing in the 730s. So the present for him was the 730s. So... If we look at it again, from that time to the present, a false prophet named Muhammad has appeared in their midst. The starting time could be any time from 610 to 641. The present is the 730s. Um, and that's a long period of time. How can a false prophet have appeared from the, the 630s all the way to the 730s? And the solution that we're going to offer today is that he's actually referring to a chain of Muhammad's. So from time to time over that period, someone would come out of the woodwork saying, I'm the, the Mahmed, I am the Aziz, or I am the, the, the Messiah. And, and then that person would, would, would uh, disappear and then someone else would come forward. That's essentially what is happening there. Do you want to come back on that, Jay? No, this makes, I, I see where you're going with this. And I think what, just so people are following you, you're saying, because we're talking about a hundred year period, 630s to 730s, no person could have lived that long. So he can't say that he appeared in a hundred year period. That wouldn't make sense because he's writing in 730. Uh, and uh, this is uh, you're, this is referring to the, the heresy of the Ishmaelites. That's the book he's writing this in 730. And that is, again, a hundred years after the Muhammad or even a hundred years after the starting point that Heraclius was killed or died in 641. So already you're talking about 90 to 100 years. You can't be, someone doesn't just appear in a 90 to 100 years. A series of people with that title would appear. Yes, that would make sense. So I see what you're inferring here, and this makes sense to me. Let's see if the others, let's see where you're going to go with it. Okay. So I think to get more uh, clarity on that, we have to turn to the Zhu Tang Shu, which is a Chinese source, um, the full, uh, address if, as it were the full uh what's the word the full reference is given there uh there's a section in the, those sources called the dashi which is the tayaye which is a tribe that was in iraq at that time and here's what it says now i suppose before we read it it's worth noting the time that this was given 
to the Chinese, it was there was invoice sent to China in the period 756 AD to 758. So it is about 20 years after the time of St. John of Damascus. So it's at the right time to give us some accurate information here. So it says there were 11 Persians, Pharisees, who came and according to their rank as Moshu, Messiah, were transformed into kings. After this, the masses gradually gave their allegiance and subsequently Persia was extinguished and Byzantine was crushed. So what is interesting here is that this, there's a word called Persians or Pharisees or Pharsees. It, it, has, a, it has a kind of a, a two meanings here because the words Pharisee and Farsi is very similar. Um, and you can have a situation where you have Jewish leaders who can be referred to as Pharisees in the sense of being rabbinical Jews, which you would find in a place like Baghdad, for example, you would you would have um, the type of Jews being referred to here. The Exilarch, for example, lived in Baghdad. Um, so those, I would suggest, are the 11 Pharisees that is being referred to. Uh, Moshu is very similar to Moshiach which is Messiah. Um, the words took a little bit of uh, decoding um, because obviously when things go from one language into another language, um, the, the original can be lost, but Moshu would suggest Messiah. And so the idea was that the, each were um, given the rank of Moshu. So one, one was a Messiah for a while and then died, taken over by someone else who, who became the Messiah as it were and were made as it were, kings of the people. And so that's would suggest that if we look at St. John of Damascus again, this idea that there was from that time to the present a false prophet named Muhammad, now it, it makes sense. So that's the idea. So I'll uh, hand it back to you, Jay. Yeah, and I think this is, I mean, we, th again, this is just supposition. This is white papers. We're putting it out there. Uh, I can see some comeback on this. They're going to say, hold on, but then why didn't John of Damascus say, plural there were some from that time that there were muhammads there were messiahs there were kings there were pharisees why didn't he say that and i would suggest the answer to that is because look where he was look look where he's situated he is right there at the heart of the umayyad dynasty he's not in the diaspora he's not in the byzantine area he is where islam where the umayyad dynasty is in its ascendancy remember look when he was there he was there during the time of abdul malik when abdul malik is creating this whole new sect, as we're finding out, another new sect, and they're looking at Muhammad, their Muhammad, as the man that is their prophet who then has to come with their revelation in order to get their identity. If that is the case, he has to be very careful how he's going to present it. So I would suggest maybe you put the two to two together with John of Damascus on this side in the context where he has to censor what he says, knowing what has happened, that there is from that time till the present. He and he assumes that his readers will know what he's talking about. The Muhammad, he, he should have said the Muhammads for our sake. That would be more helpful, like the Chinese have done. Yeah. But what he is saying, because of the fact he has to censor it, he's couching it, knowing that the people who are reading it will understand where he's going with it. Yeah, there were similar people to him that referred to the false prophet who got killed at that time for saying just that. So he took huge risks. At, in terms of giving us the information he did give us, but he was too close to the regime and there was a lot of danger for him. Um, so he had to be careful. But had he been maybe a bit braver, the chances are we wouldn't even have what we have from him because he would have been destroyed if it was too, if it was too, what's the word for uh, risque for the well, regime? As we know, they, almost everything of the marriage was destroyed. That we do know there's wholesale destruction. Even the Muslims today admit that. I mean, you can see what they say yeah. about Al Buhari. Sahih Buhari was given 600,000 of these, these akhbars, these stories by the Umayyads. And he throws out 98% and only retains 2%, 7,397 out of 600,000. What happened to the other 98%? It was shut down, it was thrown out, it was destroyed. And that's why much of why John Damascus was aware of this, because he was right there at the seat of power. He didn't know about the Abbasids coming to do that, but he knew even as Umayyad, he'd have to be careful what he said. That's why it's fascinating. fascinating. 
because we're not going. That's why we, we don't, don't trust the Abbasid narrative. It's so full of of bias. It is absolutely bias. It only retains what it yeah. wants to retain. Yet here you come up with the Chinese. Now, see, the Chinese were not under the auspices of the Abbasids. They're way off to the east. They're completely yeah. outside of this author their authority. That's why yeah. they, in some ways, are much more, uh, uh, you might say, much more important for our needs because the fact that they don't have this imposition that John of Damascus would have had or that anybody else that came during the Abbasid period would have had. The Abbasid did not have access to their material, so could not censor it. So I would go with the, yeah. the I would go with the Chinese sources before I'd go with even John of Damascus. Nonetheless, yeah. it looks like John of Damascus was inferring it, though he wasn't saying it expli uh, uh, He yeah. wasn't saying it so that we that, that like we would hope and we would have loved to have it outright. Otherwise, it would have been destroyed as well had it been had it, yeah. the, the Abbasids would have had John of Damascus material. I think as well, the, the period that they went to China, the invoice, it was just at the beginning of the Abbasid takeover. So they hadn't got their censorship fully um, formed at that stage. It was still early enough for invoice to innocently reveal a bit too right. much. By the time you have Ibn Hisham writing down this prophet's life, the, the, they, the Abbasids come to power in 750. We're now 833. That's another 80 years later. By the time Abu Hadi is given this material to censor, yes, this is censorship, uh, re, re, yeah. retaining only 2%. That is seven. Uh, now we're talking about 870. So you're talking about 120 years later that they finally get all the censorship. So you can see why this is very pivotal because this is happening while this while the Abbasids are just coming to power, not when they're in the process of doing their censorship, as we see in the ninth century. So, Good stuff. Absolutely. Okay, terrific. So the next material you're going to go into, I assume, is the the whole thing with uh, the, the identify, identifying some of these Muhammads. We're going to start to look at them. And yeah, it's a bit up. of a it's a bit of a thought experiment by AJ Juice. Some of them may hold up. Some of them might may not work. I would suggest that uh, the, the whole history is so mangled, is so um, manufactured, that this is just really a bit of fun to kind of, you know, to to turn the sin back to what the original history was. Um, but it, I think if we're looking for exact matches with the standard Islamic narrative, we're not going to get that. But we might see echoes of the characters that the the Abbasids came up with for that time frame. Good stuff. All right. This is Mel and Jay, thousands of miles apart, and here we are right next to each other talking to you, <laughs> bringing these new white papers, these new ideas that are coming. This is all brand new research. You're the first to hear it. Let's hear what your responses are. Jay and Mel, over and out. <music>